Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you could make it. Uh, we've got a lot of good material to go over today, and hopefully we'll get a good group of people. We have, uh, I think, 11 here when I just looked. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll get your questions answered about primitive pottery. So today, my subject is going to be like getting started in primitive pottery, and, and not just necessarily getting started, but specifically like, uh, you know, getting the, the things you need uh, to do it, right? So I think that's a big barrier to entry for a lot of people to for primitive pottery is well, where am I going to get the right tools or where am I going to get clay and those kind of things. So we'll talk about some different options. We're going to talk about uh, making your own tools, uh, materials. We're going to talk about um, buying where you, places you can buy tools and materials. And then also uh, we'll talk about some, some modern substitutes that work pretty good. So uh, you'll have some different options, different low cost options for getting started in primitive pottery. And hopefully uh, can help you get past that barrier to entry or perhaps there's some specific tool you've been trying to get and you, you can't figure out how to and uh, i put a few links down in the doobly-doo so you might want to check that out uh links to different places where you can buy certain things and we'll be talking about uh, different items as we go through so if you have specific questions just drop them in the chat and i'll try to get to them uh, as you know as in the order they come in as quickly as possible so i'll talk a little bit i'll go back to the chat back and forth um, and I have, a, I have a bunch of stuff around me. You can't see my workbench here. But I've got a bunch of tools here that I'm going to share with you today. So uh, it should be good. All right. Uh, a couple things I want to go over real quick before I jump into the, the chat. Um, my spring pottery workshop is full. So um, if you wanted to get in on that, uh, that ship is probably, excuse me, probably sailed. Um, there might be, there's usually a few people that, that'll drop out last minute. So it's possible uh, you know, if you keep an eye on my, um, either my community feed or like Facebook or Instagram, um, if there's any of those positions open up, I'll, I'll, you know, put a reminder in there, but it, it is full this time. I might, I might do a second spring workshop. I'm still considering my options on that. So, um, that's another possibility. Uh, Hey, make sure you hit the like button there. Uh, if you would do that for me, that'll help me a lot in the algorithm. So, um, if you hit the like button. Um, also, uh, we had a November uh, replication project. So everybody in the Ancient, Potter, Ancient Potters Club is all working on that whole com wedding base this month. And mine is right, uh oh, wrong side. Mine is right there, do you see it? Uh, and it's all done, it's just not fired yet. So um, I announced it on Instagram, this um, monthly challenge that you can participate in. And some people have already done it. So if you go to Instagram, and look for that hashtag, which is um, Ancient Pottery November. Hashtag Ancient Pottery November, all one word. Uh, you will see some of the ones that have been already done. And I know um, Steve, oh, Steven over there in, uh, in France, I think he just fired his and, and uploaded the pictures this morning. So uh, make sure you check that out. And there's still another week and a half in November. If you want to get in on that, uh, we're making the, the whole come wedding vase. And there's a picture of the ancient pot we're replicating uh, on my Instagram. And I think it's in a museum out in... Pomona, California, somewhere in Southern California. So uh, check that out if you want to get in on it. And then um, at the end of the month, I'll compile all the pictures and make like a nice Instagram post or maybe like a YouTube community post uh, showing everybody's participation. So uh, that's a fun project. And like I said, mine is mine is done just waiting to be fired. Uh, oh, and John Olson. So uh, a, couple, a few months ago, I announced here in my live stream that uh, my friend John Olson was not doing well. And... Um, he had cancer, and so uh, there was a lot of concern for him, and some of you even um, donated some money to his GoFundMe to help with his expenses. And I wanted to let you know that uh, he's doing better. So he, he got through a bunch of radiation and chemo, and I guess his cancer has shrunk or completely disappeared in some cases, and, um, and he is recovering. So uh, I wanted to let you know that John's doing a lot better. John is a, a primitive potter. He te he's taught a lot of people. Uh, he's been doing this since the 70s. I have a video. You can go check that out. You can search YouTube for John Olson. You'll see that. Uh, I have a video about him. But he's most famous for his really fine uh, corrugated pottery. So um, if you're interested in that. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to let you know was um, ask your questions. Drop your any pottery-related questions in the, uh, the chat there, and I'll get them answered. So just because if your question doesn't have to do with the subject today, that's okay, as long as it's generally related to primitive pottery okay uh so let me check also uh make sure my audio level is good let me know if, if i'm uh, 
if I'm too quiet or whatever. And, and I'll jump into the chat right now and try to get on these, okay? Uh, Lanite Dave is here from Nevada. Hey, Dave. Um, Caveman's Ancient Earthenware. Hey, uh, Chris in Kansas is here. Hey, Chris. Uh, somebody's at work. Uh, Old Ugly is here. Uh, young Willie. True, but oh, he's just talking to somebody. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ren Pixie is here. She's always here. I don't think she ever misses a live stream. Paul and Strata from El Paso, Texas. Um, survive and hello from France. There's another French. Oh, and here is uh, Mark Gibson, Southwest Pottery. We will finally are not too busy for our favorite live stream. Hello, everyone. Hey, Mark. Echo West. When calculating temper to wet clay, what would be the best way to calculate clay to temper? Does it matter if using different types of temper? Um, yeah, it, you're going to get different. Um, what's your name? Echo. You're going to get different effects based on whether your temper is wet and your clay is dry or vice versa. But also the size of your temper has a difference. Um, and, and the and the type of temper, right? So like ground sherd may act different than sand or diatomaceous earth may have different results than volcanic ash. However you do it, okay? Uh, if you want to just do it uh, by volume, that's easiest for me to just do a ratio by volume, like one scoop of temper, four scoops of clay or something like that. Um, and and it, it it's just a starting place, right? The 20% that I always say is just a starting point. Figure out what works for you with your specific clay and your specific temper. And then once you figure that out, stick with it. So when you do it, when you're trying to say do 20, um, just make sure you know how you did it. Like my temper was wet when I measured this or however. And then make sure you do it the same, that you can repeat that. That's what's important. Because the 20% is just a starting place. Eventually you're going to figure out what works best for your specific clay and your specific temper you know, your own skills and, and abilities as a potter. So once you figure that out, just make sure it's repeatable. So, um, yeah, all kinds of things have effects on uh, whether, you know, when you're measuring it wet, then you're getting less, right, of something. If you're measuring by volume or if you're measuring by weight, then when it's wet, it weighs more. You know, those kind of things. Uh, where was I? Echo West, got that. Uh, new set looks good. Yeah, Young Willie, uh, talking about my new, uh, I've been working on the, on the set here so i i painted the wall i put in new shelving i've got a like a blank space right here and i'm gonna put uh i don't know i i thought about like a uh a piece of cork board that i could pin stuff up on um but then i thought i could be cool if i got my logo like printed out you know and i could post that up there but i don't know i want to put something different in there just to break it up so it's not just a just a wall of shelves right so i've got some space here that i'll do something with um, and then I put some curtains over here, so you can't see those, but those, um, those block the light because I'm actually on a porch, and I get a lot of light, especially in the afternoon, but it makes it hard to kind of light this area consistently because uh, the light, so these black curtains kind of block out that light coming from the outside, so uh, that's kind of nice too. Uh, and I've got more stuff I'm going to do. I've also got some, I'm going to put some lights back here to kind of uh, put a little bit of backlighting behind the, those pots. Um, hey, there he is, Stephen Walford from France. Hey, Andy, just checking in from France. Great news on John. Yeah, so Stephen is the one I was saying who, uh, I think he just uploaded the picture of his finished, uh, his Holcom wedding vase today. Um, thanks, caveman. Background looks good, he says. Um, old ugly audio is good. Good. Good news about John, for sure. Thumbs up helps the channel. Yeah, give me a like if you think about it. Uh, that'd be great. Audio sounds good. Good. I'm glad. Uh, Dave says, I'm still trying to figure out measuring wet temper volume versus dry. It depends on in part on how much the clay shrinks. Yeah. So, like I said, the, the clay is going to have an effect on it. The, the, the kind of temper you use, the, like whether it's wet temper or not. So, um, the, I think the important point is you're, you're going to have to do some experiments to figure out what's the right amount for your clay and and just make sure that however you're doing that when you're experimenting that it's repeatable so once you get a test pot that comes out yeah you know, hey this one worked really good then you go okay well this one i measured it this way you know and, and just be able to repeat it i think that's the important thing at least in my opinion uh jason smith says my natural clay has too much temper my refined version has a too little still working on find the gold yeah the goldilocks zone so 
You just got to figure out where that is. So once you, if you're refining your clay, you're pulling all those particles out. And then you have to figure out how much to add back in before it's perfect. Definitely. Uh, Tyler Sell, do you have any experience with limestone temper? Or is that not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, no, I would avoid limestone temper like the plague myself. Because limestone, uh, if it gets too hot, um, that's calcium carbonate. It will turn to calcium oxide. I believe this is right. And then calcium oxide, once it gets damp, and that can be just humidity in the air, uh, will will expand and it'll make little pops in your pottery. So let me show you real quick what that looks like. So I got into, um, last year, I, I needed some temper really fast. I drove up to the base of the Catalina Mountains and I collected some sand out of a creek bed. And, uh, and I used it. And I, I ground it up real fine. And I threw it into my clay. And, um... I was making stuff. I was taking it to workshops. You know, the funny thing about calcium spalls is they'll sneak up on you because they don't happen right away. Sometimes it's months down the road before you notice them. And by then you may have already made a bunch of pots or something. So I didn't think much about it because <clears throat> the Catalinas are mostly granitic. So there's, there's, there's not a lot of chances of getting limestone or something in that. Um, but then we had our monsoon season. So around here, July and August, we get a lot of rain, a lot of humidity. And, um, my pots started having problems. And so this is one of those. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to show you. There are... It won't even focus on it. That's not, a good, that's not a good angle. Let me see if I can figure one out. Right in here. Right in here. If I can get it to focus. Hide my head. That's the problem. It wants to focus on your face so bad. I, I'm sorry, guys. It won't do it. Um, these little bits of... These little bits of uh, there's little pops. There's little pieces that have popped out of the, the surface of the pot. And right in the bottom of each of those craters is a little piece of white, which tells you there's some calcium in there, calcium oxide that has gotten damp and expanded. And it, and it makes these little little pock marks all over your pot. And depending on how much you get, it can cause a real... Pro the whole pot can come apart sometimes if there's lots of it. So that's what calcium does in your pottery. So... Uh, there's two there's two uh, strategies for it. One of like limestone. One avoid it like the plague. Limestone, but around here we also get caliche, which is a little different, but does the same thing. Uh, so avoid it or keep your temperature really low. So uh, like like I said last year, I had the sand in here I was using and it had calcium in it. And I didn't know it, uh, and I made a lot of pots. Uh, well, none of my salado none of my salado polychromes have. Well, one has. Uh, most of my Salado polychromes have not had any of those spalls uh, <clears throat> because the Salado is purposely fired very low temperature in order to not burn off that organic paint. Um, so uh, because I was firing those low temperature, it didn't get hot enough to oxidize that calcium. Um, so the other, the other uh, uh, strategy for dealing with if you were using... Like in the East, they used... Um, uh, shell like a seashell temper they just grind up seashells and throw that in their clay and that's a great temper but it's calcium right and that's why people ask me about beach sand for temper and i say well be careful because beach sand is full of little bits of seashell and little bits of seashell are calcium so if you've got that calcium you can do it you just have to make sure you fire real low like under 800 degrees so maybe you can go up to like 810 or some 820 maybe but you want to stay on the you want to stay low. Like I would be more comfortable if I know if I knew I had calcium in my clay, maybe 750 to 800 as a as a window. And that's where your infrared thermometer really comes in. Um, so I mean it's not primitive, but that infrared thermometer can help you know where you're at. And and if you're you know if you have calcium, you won't suffer that accident because you can careful monitor how hot your pottery is. If it starts getting too hot, you can. Pull the pottery, pull the fire apart, and kind of let it start cooling down. So uh, I hope that answered your question, Tyler. Uh, JD, good to jo hey, good to see you. JD Stewart uh, is here. Uh, Jerry <clears throat> and Jerry uh, actually did the um, uh, Jerry did the the H the Salado challenge. He did all of the pots. So um, I'll be sharing that picture with you guys uh, later on. I don't have it with me right now. Um, most of the pottery sherds and pots found here in West Virginia are old, made with limestone. Tin. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of the pottery on the East Coast especially is, um, well, I know a lot of it is fired with, is made with shell temper. So, uh, and like the Holcomb stuff, that's all, that red on buff, 
It's loaded with caliche. It, it, the, the clay is full of caliche, so calcium carbonate. The, the secret is keep your firing temperature, like I said, below 800. Uh, so it can be done. You just have to be careful. Um, Chris in Kansas, the bane of my early pottery making. Oh, yeah. We've, anybody who's been doing it for a while is, has probably had problems with calcium at some point. Uh, SF, this question is back to temper. Everything I fired this year cracked. So I ground up the sherds for temper, but I don't know if they actually got fired. Will that still work as temper? Um, well, you think you might have not got them hot enough to make them into ceramics? Um, i tell you what. Um, soak them in water. Take those sherds. Soak them in water. Leave them in water for a couple days. Maybe a week if it makes you feel good. Anyone that dissolves is not ceramic. Anyone that doesn't dissolve is ceramic and is good for temper. So um, that was what I would do, but pro probably if you got over, if you got over 700 C, then you know that would be definitely made. It would be ceramic, even if it's, you know, soft, low fire ceramic. Uh, and again, you know, uh, an infrared thermometer would help you out to know if you got there. Uh, Ren Pixie says, "Can temper be too fine?" I found a local wash, but the sand is very fine. No. Uh, see, and I get that a lot. A lot of people say, oh, you know, you can't use uh, diatomaceous earth. It's too fine. It's going to act like clay. Uh, and and the part of the problem is that, like somebody no said this on a, a YouTube comment recently, the definition for clay is the smallest particles of earth. You know, particles that are smaller than 0 .00, you know what I'm saying? Like really, really tiny particles. But it's not just particles. It's also the shape of them. So clay particles are flat, so they lie in there nice and, and tight together. Whereas sand particles, they're they're a little more coarse and they you know they break that up. So um, even though it's really really fine, uh, it will not uh, it will still act as temper. And that's the thing with like volcanic ash and um, and diatomaceous earth. They're very very fine, but they still work as temper because they're not shaped like clay particles. So uh, yeah, it's, Ren, it, it should work. Uh, Jason Smith, round sand versus jagged sand. A river sand is bad for yeah. Uh, exactly the same. So rounded pieces of sand are less effective as temper because um, you know they've been. Tr if you get the if you get the sand out of a river or a creek, uh, they've been tumbled. They've been washed over hundreds of years down the creek, and they've broken broken off all the sharp edges, so they're rounded. Uh, and the clay can't grip it as well. So if it's if it's sharp, uh, and that's why like diatomaceous earth and volcanic ash are good because not only are they small, but they have sharp edges. Uh, and, and that the clay can grip it really well. But what I do is I take that sand, I'll pass it through my corn grinder. I'll just run it through, grind that sand up. Uh, and that'll help make it finer, but it also kind of sharpens it, uh, breaks it up into smaller, into sharp edges so that clay can gra grip it, makes it more effective. Uh, so that's another thing you can do, even if you have sand, is just run it through your corn grinder and, uh, and make it sharper. But yeah, good point, Jason. Uh, Mark Gibson, jagged sand is best for sure. Uh, Book Davies, I thought the... Fineness made porcelain as opposed to a more common ceramic. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what makes porcelain. I'm, I'm no expert on porcelain. Um, young William having good results with diatomaceous earth. Yeah, diatomaceous earth works great. Uh, do you think coconut oil would work to seal earthenware? I don't see why it wouldn't. Uh, almost any kind of oil. Almost any kind of oil would work to seal it. Um, and, and coconut um, being edible, you know, it wouldn't be a problem like using it for food and stuff. It would automatically be food safe, right? Um, uh, I, what I would look at uh, is uh, what is it called the um, um, I always have trouble with this word. It's when, when oil becomes uh, emulsified, right? Can, can, can coconut oil emulsify and, and become hard? So look up like uh, whether or not coconut oil will do that. I think most oils will. And then find the smoke point and you have to heat it up past that smoke point, and then it'll start to kind of uh, turn into like a plastic, and then it'll be permanent. So if you can soak the pot with that oil and then and then heat it up, that should work good for you. Um, gosh, Chad Zuber's here, hey. Um, so um, he says he's used coconut oil to seal pottery, so there you have it, from the man himself. Um, okay, let me get to my notes here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, uh, tools, getting tools for primitive pottery. And I, I think there's three main areas that people that are first starting out have to kind of get past, right? First of all, you, you've got to say, where am I going to get clay? Uh, second, uh, where am I going to get these tools? And, and then third, uh, how in the world am I going to fire this pottery? So just briefly cover, you know, those 
categories, and, and mo mostly we're going to be talking about tools, but uh, let's ta start with clay. So you can find clay, right? You can go out and explore and find clay. And, and as I pointed out in some of my videos, that's a lot of fun. It, it's, a, it's a good excuse to get outdoors and do some hiking and, you know, get out there and do stuff. But um, it, that's hard. And a lot of times, some places, there's just, there's not a lot of clay. So like... I use uh, I use local clay, and I know some good sources here around Tucson where I live. But uh, it you know it's only because I've been looking for thirty years that I know those right. When I first started, I was using some pretty horrible clay because I just there's a lot of country out there you know to find it in, and, and it's not always easy. So um so that's that's a thing. But when you're wanting to get started, sometimes it's very frustrating. Like um, uh, old ugly uh, up in uh, up in Alberta. You know, and he was going around grabbing local clays, and they were all terrible, and it was holding him back from from doing what he wanted to do, which was make pottery. And so then eventually, I think he went and bought some clay, and, and then he could get started, and then, you know, and then later kind of started looking for clay again, uh, because it can be very, um, uh, it can be very frustrating. You can lose your, um, your enthusiasm for the project when all you can find is terrible clay and it's not working for you and stuff so uh, sometimes buying clay at least to get started is a good idea uh, another really great idea is to have somebody show you where clay is so like if you were if you were a potter at, at Laguna Pueblo right uh, like there's somebody that comes to these live streams who who's up at Laguna Pueblo right like you'd live in a community where there's potters and and it's general knowledge where good clay sources are or at least there's people in your community who could show you so that's really great, right? That's a big advantage to somebody in that sort of community where somebody can show you where the clay is. And, and the same is here, like in Tucson. Like if I was just getting started, I might find somebody who teaches pottery or maybe there's somebody here that does primitive pottery and just hit them up and say, hey, you, do you, can you help me? Can you show me where there's a, a place to dig clay? Because I'm, I'm really looking, I'm having trouble. And a lot of times, you know, they'll help. Some potters are really funny about that, not wanting to share, but a lot of people will help you. So that's another option. It's just, just asking somebody to show you and that'll save you years of work and, and uh, experimenting and stuff and help you get down to making pottery fast, which like I said, can help you from becoming discouraged. Um, what do I got here? I'm looking at my notes. I'm sorry. Uh, and then, you know, and there's buying clay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Like all, all of... Everybody who does primitive technology, primitive skills things, right, has to draw a line somewhere. Is what they're willing to, uh, where they're willing to draw that line between primitive and, and modern, right? So you you could be like Chad Zuber, right, and you could be out there living in a in a hut in the hills and and wearing a loincloth and 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 starting your fires with friction and all that, and that's fine, right? Or you could be uh, like a lot of my students who who buy clay. Uh, but you know they like to form it with the coil method and, and you know and and use a, a gourd rib and stuff and that and that's all the connection they need to primitive that's that's as primitive as they want to go and that's fine too right that's all I'm saying is wherever you decide to draw that line that's that's fine you want to buy clay but then you want to fire outdoors yeah, there's nothing wrong with that or if you want to uh, buy your you want to dig your own clay but you want to fire in a kiln there's nothing wrong with that either so. Don't feel like uh, there's any judgment on just how modern you want to be, right? I, I learned a long time ago that I couldn't go all the way 100% on primitive, right? Because I get in my truck and I drive out to the clay source. And then I dig that clay with a, with a shovel I bought at the hardware store. And I put it in a plastic bucket. And I carry that bucket and I take it home. And, and then I get here and uh, some people, okay, some people I know, they get home and they say, okay, this is where I'm going to draw the line. And now I'm going to grind my clay on a matate and mono. And that's fine, okay? I grind my clay in a, in a corn grinder because I'm not worried about grinding my clay authentically. Um, uh, but some people are. That, that's all good. So um, all I'm saying is there's no, there's no shame in doing primitive pottery with store-bought clay. That's kind of where I'm going. Because you have to draw that line somewhere, and that line may move over time. You may start out buying all your materials and slowly, slowly, slowly move towards using all primitive tools and everything, doing everything the way the ancients did. That's fine, too. Um, so, you know, buying clay is okay. Uh, if you do want to buy some clay uh, that you're going to use for primitive pottery, 
outdoor firing. Um, uh, New Mexico clay sells some that are really good for that, that specifically are for that kind of thing. So if you call New Mexico clay and just tell them what you're doing, uh, they can probably recommend some clays that they have. That would work good for that. Oh, let's see, um, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about temper. We already did because some of the questions were about temper, but uh, the same goes for that, right? You can you can find temper, like when I went up to the wash and got that sand and ground it up. That's fine, uh, but sometimes um, you know you, you might not have that luxury, or you might not want to go to that effort. You'd rather go down to the hardware store, buy yourself a bag of silica sand or diatomaceous earth. That's okay too. Uh, and that and that buying it might help you get started sooner, and then you can work towards using uh, authentic primitive materials later. Uh, and so, uh, uh, just real quick, um, this is I this is my uh, my corn grinder. So if you hadn't seen it, uh, when I'm talking about the corn grinder, this is what I'm talking about. And um, I put the clay in here, and I can adjust the the fineness of the grind here, and then I just. Uh, and everything inside gets gets run through there and, and comes out powder. And so I can adjust this so that it's as fine as I want, and I don't have to um, I don't have to pass it through a screen if I adjust it correctly. I can get it to come out the size I need. And I'll do the same thing with my temper. So if I'm if I'm making sherd temper, I'll throw the broken pottery sherds. I'll break them up into little bits first. Throw the sherds in there and then run them through. And then. Um, you know, I will screen that because I don't want any big chunks of temper, but um, just run it through like a window screen or something and then throw it in my clay. So um, this is a handy tool to have if you are um, uh, getting started in primitive pottery. It'll save you a lot of work. They run about, I don't know, $40, $45. Uh, and there's a link in down in the doobly-doo uh, for where you can pick those up on Amazon in case you're interested in, in getting a... A corn grinder. The other thing that I, I think I threw a link in there for is those those um, paint strainer bags. So if your clay is um, is full of too many impurities, it, it won't you know won't make good pottery until you take some of those impurities out. Uh, then you're not just going to grind it and wet it and use it. Uh, you're going to need to to clean some of that out first. So if you get it wet, put it in a bucket, get it all mixed up in the water, and then pass it through a screen. You can take that out. Now, levigation is a good, a good way to do that. That is letting it settle, pouring off that pure clay. Um, but a faster way that works most of the time, for most clays, is going to work perfect uh, and, and is faster than levigation, is getting those paint strainer bags so they're like, they're like a mesh, like a cheesecloth bag with, with elastic. They go right over a five-gallon bucket and you just pour this clay in it and then just let it, you know, milk all the clay out. Everything that's stuck in the bag then is is larger particles and that will clean your clay pretty fast. And I put a link to that down in the doobly-doo as well. So uh, different ways to process that clay. Okay, where are we at here? Um, huh, I'm not even to tools yet. I'm halfway through here. Um, let me get back to the um, uh, polymerize. There you go, Ren Pixie. That's it. Uh, I'm off to find a polishing wax later today. I hope that will work. Polishing wax. You're going to put wax on your pottery to seal it? Is that it, Dave? Polymerization. It took me about a year to find a wild clay that I like, says Dave. I came real close to giving up. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it can be very frustrating, I know. And it depends on where you live and, you know, what's around you. I found my favorite clay quite quickly, caveman. Um, to your point, says young Willie, I try to remember that ancient people would use anything they could get their hands on. Well, that's true. You're stuck with whatever's near your village in those situations. Chad says, I struggled for a long time with red clay that kept crashing until I learned about grog. Oh, yeah, I've been through that. I've definitely been through that when I was uh, learning. Uh, Caillou Chan says, I'm a primitive technology student, so your content is actually really useful for my studies. Thank you. Greetings from Nordic. Uh, Leslie Durham, wholesome, wholesome, wholesome. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Lois says, have you got any experience with clay from marshlands? I'm living in Denmark. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I live in Arizona, so honestly there's not a lot of marshlands, but there is. They call them cienegas here, but uh, there is marshlands, and, and it's all good clay. Um, you know, every clay is different, though, so um, you're probably going to find a lot of organic matter in your clay from down there, but uh, it's all worth using and drying for sure. Uh, I managed to get a corn grinder over here. Do you separate the fine dust from it? I see Wes does this. Separate the fine dust from... I managed to get... 
first of all, how did you get a corn grinder in France? Did you have it shipped overseas or did you find somebody that was selling them over there? And second, what do you mean by do you separate the fine dust from it? I don't know what that means, uh, Stephen. If you could elaborate, that'd be great. Um, how to get perfect paint. <laughs> how to get perfect paint, says uh, Mahela Dunu. Dinu. Um, buy it at the store. I, yeah, there's a lot. Paints, paints are really um, advanced lesson and and I do have some good videos on making mineral and organic paints so you might check those out but um, it, it's a it's a very I'm not going to go too much into paint today because that's that is complicated and there's many different recipes and materials and such uh, let's uh, let's move on if you guys could do me a favor uh, and hit that like button uh, that'd be great uh, because that'll help me out with the algorithm okay and meanwhile I'm Changing pages here. I'm going to the next page. We're going to talk about tools. Okay, so uh, first of all, you know, you can buy tools, right? Um, that's that's the way to get started fast. You can just buy the, a lot of the tools you need. I mean, not everything is buyable all the time. Like, my website is the only one I know of that sells uh, those gourd scrapers, right? And uh, even people in, in Europe and some places have trouble getting their hands on gourds. So this... You know, this is what I'm making them out of. And right now they're out of stock on my website because <clears throat> I got really behind on them. And I have to make each one of those by hand. So um, I, I put them out of stock so I could get caught up. I still have a couple to make uh, pretty soon here this week. Um, but this is this is what I'm using to make a gourd. And I just take a, a carpenter's saw, just a regular hand saw, and I cut it. I'll cut it into four bits and, and break it down till I have just a, you know, a chunk here. It might be kind of square because it's cut, right? And um, and then I'll just use a rasp to shape it. Um, you no, know, but a lot of work goes into it. It's a lot of labor. So, um, the thing is, you can you can make your own. These are pretty easy to make. Um, if you can get a hold of the gourds. Now, some people might not know how to get a hold of gourds. I did put a link down in the doobly doo to the Wurtz Gourd Farm, uh, where I where I buy gourds. It's it's up in uh, Coolidge, Arizona, and that's a great place. And they have they will ship. Um, I don't know if they ship internationally. I don't know what their rules are. But last time I was up there, I did ask him because somebody here on YouTube said uh, I had checked with them and, you know, there's a minimum order of like 20 gourds or something. And so I asked him and he said no. He said he will ship individual gourds. So they're really nice people. If, if the website makes it seem like they won't ship individual gourds or something, um, call them because uh, they really are nice and I think, I think they'll work with you. Uh, that's the Wurtz Gourd Farm in Arizona. There's other gourd farms around. I mean, you might find one in your area, too. Um, and, and you can make those real easy. But, you know, they're not always um, they're not always gourds. So these are the, you know, I've been working on, I've got a big bowl right here I've been working on. I'll show you in a minute. Um, you know, these are the little gourd scrapers I use. Um, they're, I mean, they're just a little kidney-shaped bit of gourd, right? But um, uh, I've got some that are ceramic, right? So these are made out of old pots. You can take <clears throat> bits of pots and, and grind them down to the right shape and, you know, makes a good scraper, right? Or you can use all kinds of things. I did a video where I made one out of um, an old uh, detergent bottle, right? Just cut it with a pair of scissors and then kind of sand it off the edge. That works great. Um, you can go down to the ceramic supply store and buy like a rubber rib or something that, you know, you can make a lot of things work. So, um, and then and then like if you're doing paddle and anvil, like uh, Tony Soros, you know, he, uh, he sometimes sells those. Um, my wife's going to work. Um, he sometimes tells kits. Um, make sure you shut that door so I don't hear the car. Um, he, Tony sometimes sells kits where he'll sell like a, a paddle and an anvil. and I, There might be some other stuff in there too. Um, but he doesn't always. But check with Tony. Uh, Tony's got a channel here on YouTube. Um, I'll put his link in the doobly-doo later. Uh, but it's not there now. Um, but you can just search uh, Tony Soares Pottery. He'll, he'll pop up. Um, and he sells kits with paddles and anvils and stuff. And, and that's a good option if you want to try that method. I don't do that. I don't sell those kits. And I don't know where else you'd find one. Um, but that's a good option. Uh, and, the, and so then, uh, like, I don't have a pookie up here. I grabbed all these tools. I need to grab a pookie. So um, pookies is another thing that, uh, you know, people struggle with. They're like, well, how can I start making pottery like you? I don't have all those pookies. I have a big stack of them back here. Um, this is the base mold for your pot, right? So you, you build your pot out of this. It keeps that nice round bottom, allows you to turn it around and stuff. But but, um, but there's all kinds of options, right? You can use a modern bowl, just like a plastic bowl or a glass bowl, but you want to put like a piece of cloth in it so the clay doesn't stick. 
Uh, it's easy enough to do though. I mean, when I was a kid, I just raided my mom's cupboard in the kitchen. A lot of my early pots, uh, the bottoms are shaped like a Corelware bowl. So they kind of have this unique Corel where it comes up and then it kind of flare, <laughs> comes flares out. Looks terrible on a, you know, on a prehistoric pot replica, but um, that's what I had, right? Um, you know, you don't have to, I have a, I have a free lesson, a video lesson on how to make a pookie. Uh, the link you get, you get my lesson by subscribing to my email newsletter. So I have a monthly newsletter where I talk about primitive pottery and, and these kind of things and announce workshops and stuff that are coming up. Um, uh, if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll get a link uh, with a with a coupon code, and that you can use on my store to get a free the free video lesson on how to make a pookie. If you're looking to make a ceramic pookie, that's handy. Um, but you can use all kinds of things, and also New Mexico clay, which I mentioned earlier, um, they sell pookies, and they do have them listed as in stock now, which a lot of times they're not. Uh, and the link to New Mexico clay's pookies is in the doobly doo, so uh, check that out as well. Uh, so it's another example, uh, just like with the gourds, where um, you can you can buy them, you can make them, or you can do like a modern substitute, you know, something else like a glass bowl. So, uh, and I think in a lot of cases you'll find those are your, you know, those are, those three options are available to anybody, depending on where you at. You know, if you want to get started, just get just buy them or just use a modern substitute and get started making the pottery. That way you can stay motivated, right? And then later. You can always, uh, you know, work on getting more authentic tools. That, 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 uh, that's how I see it, see it. Because you don't want to, like, just be depressed and then never get started. Okay. Um, let me check the chat really fast, make sure I haven't missed anything. Uh, Paul Estrada, do I polish first, then brush slip? No. You slip and then polish. You slip, and then when the pot's uh, drier, you polish. Uh, glass beyond. I made my gourd scraper works great. They do take a bit of work for sure. Yeah, it's just, just a little bit of effort. Yeah. Uh, Stephen says, yeah, shipped from Italy. I mean, after I grinded, there's a lot of dust. You separate the dust from, no, uh-uh, use it all. Uh, because like I said, um, those, those little bits, even though they're very, very fine, are not going to impact the quality of your clay. At least in my experience, they don't. I'm not going to say they aren't because, I mean, if Wes or somebody's doing it, I don't know, um, but I no, I do not separate it. I, when I he's talking about when we grind temper, I throw sherds in my corn grinder, right? Um, I throw sherds in my corn grinder. I grind them up, and then I don't separate like the coarse from the fine. I I I throw it through a window screen to take out the larger chunks, and then I throw it all in my clay because th those fine bits are not clay. Like you can take the finest finest of that ground sherd powder, right? And you can get it wet. Here, here's the thing. Here's what, what do they call temper? The definition of temper is non-plastic material. Does it feel plastic? It doesn't. I don't know, you know, why it changes, but it's, it is not plastic. It's the same with, um, with like your diatomaceous earth, right? When you get it wet, does it feel plastic? Mm -mm. It's not plastic. So it's going to still work as temper. Um, Caillou Chan, yeah, we don't have that kind here, but I think we can grow if you've got seeds. Oh, he's talking about gourds. Yeah, there's a lot of places in the world where they have trouble getting gourds. Um, Young Willie, uh, Stephen makes mine with coconut shells. I started using river clay. Lanite Dave, my wife is searching for the New Mexico clay site now. I think you've crashed their servers. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? Um, I've always wanted to... Um, to get like a like a referral account there so I can get like a small commission when I sell stuff for them and I, and I never have um, but that'd be great if anybody watching from New Mexico clay I would like to uh, I mean I send a lot of business that way you'd be surprised how many corn grinders I sell through Amazon it's ridiculous uh, hey uh, straw rope factory is here uh, and young Willie points out that coconut shell works great too so that's true if you don't have access to gourds and you can get coconut shells uh, they can work as well all right, uh, let's move on. Uh, scraping tools, right? So um, I use um, like a like a deer rib to scrape the outside of the pot to scrape it smooth. That works really good. Just a rib from a from a deer or an antelope, something small like that. Um, but there's a lot of things you can use, right? Um, you can make them out of like shell or or uh, bone if you don't have a rib, a different kind of bone, or even a piece of hardwood, like a really hard, like a piece of oak, and and just make it into a, a nice fine straight edge that you can scrape with. That's great. I have these um, bits of river cane. So this is cane, 
and I've, I've cut it into links and then I split it four ways so it's a quarter of a piece of cane and um, and I, I use these uh, for the same thing to scrape the outside of the pot with and they work really good so that's another option and then um, you know for store-bought items right um, the old metal rib this works the same as like the um, the piece of deer rib you just scrape that outside of the pot smooth you can buy these at any like a craft store like a Michaels or Hobby Lobby or like a ceramic supply store uh, or you know you want the cheap option the old credit card gift card hotel room card whatever you know these are great for scraping the outside of your pot so lots of options there uh, different things you can make them with uh, needle tools right I made uh, where's my homemade needle tool at I hope it's here I'm not seeing it right now here it is I have a video I made recently. I, you know, I like the needle tools. They sell them. You know, you can buy needle tools. I don't think I have it here. I don't know where it's at. I, I have a, a store-bought needle tool. You know, they're metal and they have a, a long like uh, spike sticking out, you know, like a little nail, and you can use it to cut, like trim your rim or cut holes in your pottery or whatever. Handy, handy tool. Um, down in Mata Ortiz, Chihuahua, they use syringes, actual like medical syringes, uh, to cut. Uh, the pots and stuff. They, and if you see, if you ever see a, a pottery making demo from a Mata Ortiz potter, they'll usually have a syringe there sitting on the table with their tools. Uh, so I made this. Uh, this one was made with a mesquite thorn. So that's just a thorn off a mesquite tree. Uh, and so far it's held up really good. I made two of these at the same time. This one with mesquite, I made another with a, the thorn from a saguaro cactus. And the saguaro one broke uh, pretty quickly. And this one's held up. So the mesquite uh, wins for durability on that. But, you know, uh, be inventive. You might not have mesquites or saguaros where you live, but I'm sure you can think of something around there that would work just as well. Um, polishing stones, right? Um, I buy, this one is um, petrified wood. Uh, I buy these at the, at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show, which comes here every, like, February. Uh, and, and these work great, right? I sell these on my website if you're interested in polishing stones. I don't have any more petrified wood, but I still have lots of fluorite stones that I sell. So um, if you're interested in that, um, there's a lot of places you can buy some stones. There's places online. There's probably local rock shops in your area where you can buy lapidary stones. Um, you know, but that my favorite stones are not the, the store-bought ones. Uh, like this one I found on the beach in California. I have a couple of these that came from the beach that are just wonderful, wonderful. The shape of it fits in your hand really good. It's got different angles on it for reaching different parts of the pot. Um, and, and this one, uh, it's got a lot of clay on it right now. This one is an actual relic from that was found in a Salado ruin. Uh, it was given to me by um, a family years ago that had dug it up back in, I don't know, the 50s or something on their ranch. So uh, all, you can use all kinds of things. I've got... Um, some little engine push rods work great for polishing. You can reach inside, like if you have a handle or something, get inside the handle and polish. You can get down inside of a of a mug or something and polish. Um, all, you know, there's no end to the things you can do or think of that will work for, for polishing stones. Lots and lots of things. What time we got? 43. Um, paint brushes. Uh, it's the same thing, right? You can buy... You buy commercial paint brushes. I've got some really nice uh, brushes that I bought. At, I don't know. I can't get any contrast here. Um, I've got some nice commercial brushes that I bought. They have some long bristles because I like the long ones for pulling lines. Um, you know, I have some. Uh, let's see what I got. I got some of these like these Japanese brushes. These are nice. I like these, especially for like slip for like large areas. They have a, they can hold a lot of material. You can cover a lot of country with that. Um, but you know. Uh, I've got some of these uh, homemade brushes made with hair, made with like children's hair. They just get a, a stick, right? And then they'll um, they'll put the hair on there so that it lines up nice and straight with the end of the stick. And then they wrap it with thread really tight. And then they put like some wax. I think this one's like wax, it's like candle wax, but it might be some kind of glue. And they, they'll just glue that together then at the end. And then it's, it's a good little brush, a really nice, like a fine, fine liner brush made from children's hair. Uh, and then I have these um, uh, yucca brushes. So these are made with the leaves of a yucca. And you can, um, I just rot these. So I stick the leaves down in some water and leave them there for a couple weeks. And then the flesh will rot off. Then I can take like a, a spoon or something and just clean all the flesh off of there. Um, so 
uh, if you don't have uh, yuccas, yuccas can be found a lot of places because uh, they're used in landscaping. So I know people that live in like Australia or different parts of the world who've been able to find yuccas in their area, uh, you know, in landscaping. You just need a couple of leaves, you know. I mean, nobody's going to miss a leaf or two. Um, but if you don't, I, I do I do sell uh, like bundles of 10 yucca leaves, you know, if you want to just try that and you don't live someplace where yuccas naturally grow. Um, not trying to get rich on it, just uh, just trying to help people out. Uh, so again, what, what did we say the options were, right? You can buy, you can make, or you can use modern substitutes. So um, it's the same with the paintbrushes. Um, let's see. Let me look back at the... Uh, I'll look back at the chat really quick, and then I'll show you my, my project I've been working on. I've got a big bowl here, and we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about paint, okay? Uh, let me get back to where I was on the chat real quick, if I can. Um, and do you ship worldwide? No, I only ship domestically. Even people in Canada can't get my stuff. Um, how can you tell if a clay will hold organic paint? Um, you can't. You have to put that organic paint on it, fire it, and then, then you'll know. That, that's how I found it. I mean, I spent 30 years looking for the right stuff. And I did a lot of test firings. Uh, Dr. Rattenkaiser, I want to thank you very much. I started collecting my own clay and orienting myself towards local ceramics. I looked at Germanic ceramics in several museums. Unfortunately, these are not very fancy. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about the uh, ceramics in Germany. Ceramic, ceramic ceramics is what I wanted to say. Uh, but uh, there are some beautiful ancient pots in, in Europe in general. So... Um, but you know, I mean, there's I know I have plenty of students in in Europe that are making southwestern Native American pottery too. So I mean, if you don't like what you have, find something else, I guess. Do you happen to have flints in your stone, or do you mean store? I don't have flints in my store. I do have some uh, some flint knives. Uh, so this is like a like a stone knife that uh, was made for me. I don't I don't do flint napping. I've tried it. I've done some flint napping. Um, this was made for me. I teach at the, the field school, the archaeology field school every summer. And the guy that does their um, experiential archaeology program up there, he does all kinds of things. He makes beads. He does flint napping, atlatls. Um, he always get, he's always giving me stuff. So I've got a couple of his knives uh, and different tools that he makes that way. Uh, when I add temper, the clay feels too gritty. Does that mean the clay already has enough? Yeah, it's possible, cavemen, that your clay already has enough temper. Um, but you know, only experimenting will will try will figure it out. But you know, if you if you can if you before you add any temper to it, try making a little rope. You know, wrap it around your finger. Does it make a coil? Does it want to crack? If it's short, then uh, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it needs temper taken out of it, uh, or maybe um, maybe it's not even suitable clay. Um, I I've got some good videos on testing clays, so you might want to check those out if you haven't already seen them. Young Willie says, "I thought you were going to get stung on the." Cactus when you made the needle, yeah, um, you know, they, it won't kill you. But yeah, I've, I've been I've been poked a few times for sure. The same with like getting those yucca leaves. When you go to get the yucca leaf, you gotta reach down in the middle of those things, and they're they're poking you all over on the arm when you do that. It's just part of just part of the experience. Does humidity make any difference in building when it's dry out? My coils tend to break easily. When it's dry, you have to work harder at keeping your clay moist, keeping it wrapped up, um, you know, wetting your pot as you work so it doesn't dry out. Um, when it's humid, you don't have to worry about that. But on the other hand, your pottery won't dry to a use, you know, to a workable state as easily. So when I'm making pottery, different things I do at different stages of dryness. And so when I'm letting it dry before I can stone polish it, for example, sometimes I only have to wait a couple of hours, whereas people in like Florida might have to wait a couple of days because it's going to dry a lot more slowly. So humidity makes a huge difference. Um, Caillou Chan, time to butter my aunt who lives in Arizona to buy stuff from you and then bring it here when she comes. Where, where do you live, Caillou Chan? Uh, if you said, I don't remember. That's what I'm interested in, replicating European Bronze Age pottery. Bell Beaker. Oh, that's cool stuff, yeah. Uh, S. Harvey says, love your channel. Thank you. Uh, Star Rope Factory says this live stream ex exists. Yes, it certainly does exist, Star Rope Factory. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, uh, I'll show you what I'm doing here. Let's uh, change the, um, hit the like button if you can. I appreciate it very much. 
And now, let me show you my workbench really quick. I've got junk everywhere right here, but I'm just going to show you. Oop. If I can move the, the camera over. There we go. I think that'll work. Okay. Here's all the, all the stuff I'm trying to... So this is my big bowl I'm working on. This is... um. This is 14 inches in diameter when I made it. It'll it'll shrink as the clay dries. But this is the this is the big. If you're watching, if you watch my last video, the uh, about the ancient pottery challenge, um, this is that Encinas red and brown, the Mogion red and brown bowl. So. Um, really big. And that's uh, that's my project this week that I've been working on. And then um, what I need to do, the reason I have it wrapped up, is it's just at the right consistency. And I'm going to, um, as soon as I'm done with this live stream, I'm going to stone polish the outside. And then here's a little bowl I'm working on. I slipped this yesterday and polished it. And I'll put some paint on it this afternoon if it gets dry enough. That's what I've been working on this week. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about paint. Uh, pa paint is probably... Uh, the hardest thing uh, to do yourself uh, because um, there's just there's a lot of complexity there's a lot of complexity to paint so like you can go out and find hematite for example this is hematite iron oxide natural iron oxide and, and grind it up and it's ground up now it's a it's a powder and then you you know you have to mix it with stuff so you have to once I've got that powder, then I'm mixing it with about a third clay to fix it, to make it harden on the pot. And then you usually need some organic binder. And this is some um, mesquite sap, crystallized mesquite sap. So I'll put a little of that into it. And that will make, um, that'll make it, uh, make it kind of sticky, gives it some viscosity. So it sticks to your brush, flows onto the pot. Also, it keeps you from wiping it off as you handle the pot when you're painting it. So it'll kind of stick it on the pot before the firing. There's a lot to it, right? And that's just iron, right? So then you might use copper carbonate. You might use manganese dioxide. These are all different things. And you have to mix them with a little clay and you have to grind them up and you have to add some binder. And so there's a lot of complexity to paints. And, and in that case, that's another example of where if you're just starting out, you might, you might just go to Amazon and buy some iron oxide. You can do that. You can buy some manganese dioxide in a small package already ground up. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, and then you just have to add a little clay to it. And, you know, maybe if you need binder, you don't have mesquite sap, you don't know where you could get anything like this, uh, you know, you can use some um, some organic binder from your fridge, right, like maple syrup or or, um, or caro syrup or something like that that's just going to make it a little bit sticky and help it kind of stick on the pot. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do uh, where, you're, where you're purchasing that material. You know, if you want to, you can go down to the ceramic supply store and, and get some like um, underglaze. You can get black or red underglaze, underglaze paint. These are like ceramic paints, uh, you know, commercial ceramic paints and paint your pot with that and not worry about it. And then maybe down the road, look at getting some uh, authentic uh, stuff. There's no shame in when you're starting out, you know, just starting simply and then moving into more complex as you go along. Because you don't want to get to that point where you're frustrated and you're like ready to quit because you know, it's really complicated. Like I said, the barrier for entry to primitive pottery is having all this stuff, you know. How am I going to get started when I have to have all this stuff? Where am I going to get all this stuff? Start simple. Buy some clay. Maybe buy some underglaze, you know, and, and just think, I'm, the only thing I'm going to do the same right now is I'm just going to coil it or I'm just going to fire it in my yard and then uh, I'll work on the other parts later. So uh, it, it, there's no shame in that. Okay, so uh, real quick, before I jump back into the chat, I want to talk about firing. So uh, when you're firing, now you could fire in your yard using charcoal, like I've showed. Uh, that's Tony Sora's method, and um, that works great if you're in a town or something. You don't want to go out to the country. But sometimes you want to fire outdoors, and you want you need cover sherds, and you don't have cover sherds, right? Like these are pieces of broken pottery that I place around the pot to keep the fuel from falling on it so that the colors stay bright. Uh, and so in that case, you might use like a bucket, like I'll use like a, like a galvanized bucket uh, or pieces of, you know, just pieces of metal. Like if you have some old scrap metal that you can like lay around it or like even like a flower pot uh, down in Mata Ortiz, you see that a lot where they'll use a flower pot as kind of a sagger. But just if you want to oxidize it, if you want to get those colors bright, then, you, you know, don't set that flower pot right on the ground. Prop it up so you get oxygen under it and you get some flow in there and then the, the colors will be nice and bright. 
Uh, there's a lot of things you can do uh, for cover shirts. And kiln furniture is the same way, right? So when I fire outdoors, I use rocks. I, I'll set a rock on top. I'll, I'll build a fire with coals. I'll set a rock on top of those coals, and I'll stack the pot on top of that rock. But some people live places where there's not rocks, right? I, in Arizona, we take rocks for granted. You don't go anywhere there's not rocks. But I know if you live in Louisiana, you don't just go find a rock, right? I mean, you might be like, where am I going to get a rock? Um, like bits of brick work really good for kiln furniture. When I fire in my yard with charcoal, that's what I use for kiln furniture. Uh, kiln furniture is just the stuff that holds the pots you know, up. I, I just take, I have bits of brick that I've broken off, little small cubes of, of red brick, uh, and those work really great. So that's a good option. Uh, the same with, um, with flower pots. Uh, when you break a flower pot, you'll get that square piece at the bottom where it makes the bend to the bottom, and, uh, and you can turn those on their side, and those are great for propping pots up. So uh, pottery as well can work as kiln furniture. Or you can just stack them up. You can stack up three or four shirts of flower pot. You know, you've got plenty of uh, space there. Um, gloves, uh, sometimes you need like some welding gloves. Not, not always authentic, but um, definitely prevent accidents, prevent you from burning yourself. Um, you know, some good welding gloves. You can find welding gloves any place. I mean, they probably sell welding gloves at, you know, at Walmart. Um, definitely you can get them at like, you know, Home Depot and stuff. So welding gloves, that's another thing that you can buy on Amazon too. Um, and, and these are a little bit modern, modern nice to haves when you're firing, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Um, my friend Clint used to say, oh, you, you know, you need to, you need to be out there firing like the ancient people did. And I think, you know, I, I fired like the ancient people did. Well, you know, I fired with Chad Zuber a couple months ago and, and he was barefoot, uh, but uh, I've never fired barefoot, I got to say. Um, but, you know, I, I burned myself plenty of times. I think at some point you just move on and go, I don't want to burn myself anymore. So I wear gloves and you know, I wear a long sleeve shirt. The ancient potters didn't have long sleeve shirts or gloves, right? Uh, some people out at the kiln conference, they wear those like face shields, those clear face shields to keep that radiant heat off your face. You know? That's another one of those like different people make different decisions on where they draw that line between traditional and, and you know, ancient and modern materials. Uh, another thing that I do is I have that infrared thermometer. So I've got that little infrared thermometer gun and I, I think I put a link to that down in the doobly-doo too if you're interested. But um, those are just nice to have, right? So you can monitor the temperature. So when you get your pot back, you know, and you go, well, this came out really good, but I have no idea what temperature I fired it to. It's good to know, because then next time you might go, okay, well, look, I got these results when I got up to 800, but when I fired to 700, it didn't come out. This this clay turned a whole different color, you know. It's good to know what temperature you got to that it helps you draw conclusions about your materials and your firing and stuff. Uh, and like I said, if you're dealing with calcium, you know, that infrared gun is going to help you figure out, you know, where that line is and, and not cross it if you need to be careful of that. So um, the infrared gun is another uh, nice to have uh, modern tool. Uh, I'll jump back into the uh, chat here and see what I've got. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff here. Hold on. Okay. Oh, Finland. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a long way for me for sure uh let's see how long after making the fired the first test piece can you fire it i've seen in the videos that you use the oven but can you make test pieces one day and fire the next oh yeah it depends a lot on your clay how porous it is how how fast it dries out and also on your environment right in tucson things are going to dry a lot faster than they would um you know in louisiana or florida or someplace that's really damp so um but yeah no uh you can fire the same day if, if, if you uh, have those surroundings, you know, um, that like a lot of times when you're firing a piece, you know, like a pot like this, you're worried about rim cracks. So you're drying it carefully upside down because you don't want it to crack. But if you've got just a little test tile, you're not worried about rim cracks, right? You can just set it out and let it dry. Um, so yeah, a lot of times for test pieces, especially there's a pretty short turnaround. Um, now, I don't dry them in the oven. I, the, the, if you dry them too fast, they will crack. I don't set them in the sun. I don't dry them in the oven. I let them dry naturally, and then I'll put them in the oven to preheat them just to make sure I've got all the moisture out before I uh, fire it. Uh, Eutheus Red. Hello, Andy, and thank you 
Uh, I learned important things. Your content is super interesting and you explain really well. I wish you the best and the future in the future. Greetings from France. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Star Rope Factory says that's a big bowl. Yeah, I, I, it's bigger than my. If you guys saw the video, where is it at? It's over here. No, I'm, it's weird. It's backwards. Uh, where I made that Dinwiddie bowl. Um, the Dinwiddie bowl is like 12 inch diameter, and this one here is uh, like 13. So, uh, it's bigger than that. Uh, epic pottery setup. Thank you, funny. Uh, Dave says, what did you use for the pookie on that really big bowl? So I used the, um, uh, the ceramic pookie. I have two of these. Um, this is the same pookie I used for the, um, Dinwiddie bowl. Um, you know, but I just, I just brought it out farther from the edge. Um, and these are the pookies that I made based on, um, Michael Hawley's pookie. So I made a video last summer about this replicator, this old replicator, he's uh, passed away now, named Michael Hawley. And, um, and somebody, a friend of mine had one of his old plaster Paris pookies. And so uh, I made uh, a mold that I can make these on. So I have a hump mold that I can, I can create a slab of clay, drape it over this hump mold and make those pookies. So um, if you want to go back and check out that video, um, that's what those are. Those are uh, replicas of Michael Hawley's pookie, or at least size replicas. Now I think he made it over a, after, now I, I think he made this after a, an anch, actual ancient pot. And the reason I say that is it's not it's not perfectly round. It's a little bit oh wow this is so weird. Um, it's a little oval and there's a there's a there's a bump in it. Uh, I'll talk about it in the in the video that I'm making about this bowl. There's a little bit of a bump. There's a place here where it kind of like lifts up on one spot, and so. You have to, when you put it back on the pot, you have to make sure it gets to the right spot. Otherwise, it's going to get all screwed up because there's a, there's a hump in it. Um, but because it's wonky like that, I think it was actually made from a, from a prehistoric pot. Michael Hawley had been a pot hunter back in the day, so he probably formed the original off of an actual ancient pot. And now I'm three or four down the road still making pots off of that pot, which is kind of cool. Um, Stephen Walford. How do you keep your rim staying circular? Mine dry at some strange shapes at times. Um, I don't know. Um, you make it circular, right, when you start, and then it, it tends to stay circular. I think the only thing that it's important is make sure that it dries evenly, right? Because if, as that pot's drying, it's shrinking. And you don't want it to dr shrink unevenly. And, and sometimes you'll get kind of wonky because it dried unevenly. So, um, like this... This sat out all night drying last night, but I had it covered up. Uh, and then I make sure it stays pretty, you know, that dries as evenly as possible. I, that's the only thing I can tell you. Uh, it depends on your clay, too. Different clays have different um, different amount of uh, not only just shrinkage, but also the, certain clays are more inclined to warp as they shrink than others. Uh, Jason uh, Smith says, when using a pookie, I have had issues with new lays. Layers of coil cracking, all because I didn't maintain the right balance of humidity in the piece versus the new coil. Uh, if, you're, if your pot has dried out quite a bit before you add another coil, um, I, well, I don't let it get too dry. You, you should not let it get too dry between. I mean, you could wrap it up in plastic or something to keep that from happening. But if it dries more than I want, I'll get a little water and add it on top of that old coil a couple minutes before I attach that first coil. Uh, that way, it has a t chance to kind of soften up a little bit. But I, I can't say that I've had cracking, so I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, funny, what is the easiest paint to make the primitive way? Um, probably organic paint, because all you have to do for organic paint is just get the plant, boil it down, strain out the solids, and you just boil it down. So um, that's probably the easiest, and that's probably why it was so popular in the ancient Southwest, because it didn't require so many steps, didn't require so many different ingredients. Uh, Jason Smith says iron oxide plus slip. That's pretty easy. Yeah. What is your thing with oil, Star Rope Factory? I don't get it. You keep mentioning it. Can you use resin as a binder? Um, Clary Design. Hey, Clary Design. Uh, I have something for you, man. Um, you need to send me an email. My email address is andy at ilabmedia.com. Um, or use the contact form on my website, okay? Uh, I grabbed something for you at the Kiln Conference. And I need your mailing address. So, uh, can you use resin as binder? I would think so. Like, like this. I mean, that's all. That's all 
um, that mesquite sap is it's just resin right i mean it's just a it's tree resin so i would i would think it would work pretty much the same but i mean experiment you know right um great info andy says cjs uh i lost my place it just jumped sorry many thanks andy you saved me years of blundering by giving the facts <laughs> yeah yeah well that I, that's a that's one of my motivations in doing this is that you know, i i spent years trying to learn it myself and it's, it's very frustrating i know so hopefully i'm saving some people some time uh, a lot of potters are really closed about sharing information um, i'm trying to be the anti that andy ward is really likable his videos never get old thank you straw rope uh, i've got some broken fire bricks that i'm going to use during firing good that'll work good ren uh kiln furniture make sure the rocks are good and dry or they will blow up yeah so what i do old ugly is when i'm preheating my pottery around the fire I preheat my kiln furniture as well. That way I make sure, uh, you know, that they've got that moisture out of them. Also, I try to select rocks that are um, that are porous. Uh, so I try to get like sandstone or, or other porous rocks like that and avoid really dense rocks like flint, right? Or like quartz uh, because you, it's harder to get the moisture out of a more dense rock. Uh, so selection of, of those rocks is important. Uh, Dave says the ancients fired with no protective gear, but they had short lifespans. That's right. I don't want to die at 30. I'd already be dead. Will the same clay turn different colors depending on the temp? Uh, yeah, yeah. Depending on, uh, caveman says, well, different clays turn different colors depending on the temp. Uh, yeah, depending on the temp, but even more important, depending on the atmosphere. So the atmosphere in an outdoor firing varies a lot. Like it can be really, really sooty or, or have not a lot of oxygen or it can have a lot of oxygen. And, and that's going to have a huge impact on it. Or how long the duration of firing, how long it, it fired can have an impact on it as well, the color. Uh, CJS, good to do test tiles with a notebook. Oh, yeah, yeah, taking notes is another, actually, I could do a whole video on that. Uh, a really important skill um, because so many, me especially, but so many other potters I know, you know, it's something they've had to learn over time because... You know, you, you go grab some clay and you, and you make a pot with it and you come back and you're like, wow, this worked out really good. And then you're like, wait, I'm, I'm not sure which clay this was. Where did I get this? Or how did I process this clay? Or uh, what temperature did I fire it to? So taking notes is a whole nother thing that is very important. You're right. Uh, o -O -E you know, O-O-E-E, U-E, -E -E. I don't know how to pronounce your name. So someday you're going to have to tell me how that's done. Ui says, is a fire cloud caused by uneven heating, different colors from hotter fuck? No, a uh, fire cloud is caused by uh, carbon. A, a, usually it's a piece of fuel sitting on the pot. So uh, when you're firing, you had a, like a log or whatever you're burning, you know, charcoal sitting on the pot as it was cooling and that carbon just went right in there. So um, that fire clouds are usually just places where the fuel was touching the pottery, which is why cover sherds prevent that. Sometimes it can be a cool area, though. Sometimes, if you don't get hot enough, you can get fire clouds under your cover sherds just because that's kind of a heat sink and it, it didn't get hot enough to oxidize that carbon out. As you learn to fire better, you, you won't have those. But when I first started, early on, I used to get those a lot because I wouldn't get my temperature up high enough. I'd only get into, like, the 600s, and, and you'd end up with spots where you just didn't get hot enough. So um, make sure you get your fire hot enough for sure. Uh, dangerous Witch, interesting thinks it's carbon. Many thanks. Love the idea of the pookie passing on and on slightly different. Very beautiful. Thank you. I like the video with Chad. Your pottery is so good. Thank you, Timmy Vision. What would happen if I used sea beach sand as temper? Uh, I talked about that earlier in this live stream. If you want to go back and, and catch that when I'm done, but um, sea beach sand works for temper, but it's, it's loaded with calcium because it's full of seashell bits and seashells are calcium. So if you're using beach sand, you have to make sure you keep your temperature below about 800 degrees so that calcium doesn't turn to calcium oxide, which will then cause pops and spalls on your pottery. Uh, just must go. Good night, everyone. Keep it up, Andy. All right, everybody. Um, I've been here over an hour. I hope I answered all your questions. Um, give me a like if you would, please, because uh, that'll help me with the algorithm. Uh, I appreciate everybody's... Uh, questions and comments. Um, I hope, uh, I hope I covered it good.